Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. You know, the last couple of years have been kind of strange years. Uh, we've talked about the Great Resignation uh, during COVID, uh, where people, you know, maybe because they were staying home, maybe because of uh, not having to commute, maybe because of, you know, spending a lot more time with their kids and stuff like that, uh, decided to change uh, what they were, what their priorities were in life. And now we've got something that to people are calling um, uh, the great breakup, which is uh, females that are leaving the workplace. And so I thought it would be really interesting to check in with a human resource expert. Frank Newman is his name. He is the founder and CEO of Newman Human Resources Consulting. He's based in Breslau, Ontario. And uh, find out a little bit about, you know, what's going on right there on the street from someone that's dealing with human resource issues all the way. Frank's going to share his perspective uh, on what's happening in the world of work today with us. Uh, he'll share his insights into how the work environment is changing and what all of us can do to survive either as an individual or as a company. Frank's been in business for 47 years, uh, worked in human resources to create great working environments where the best people want to come to work every day. Frank, welcome to the show, sir. Great. Well, thank you very much, Brian. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I'm, I'm delighted to be able to share some insights into what I call the wacky world of work in uh, in 2023. The wacky uh, world of work. The wacky world of work, because every day there's something different, whether it's silent quitting, revenge hiring, or just people turning off. But at the same time, there's all kinds of opportunities for people in companies to really wow. excel and, and kind of seize this moment because this is a, a time unlike any other in our history. Revenge hiring? I haven't heard that one before. What's revenge hiring? Revenge hiring is where you get ticked off at your boss and you decide to send a thousand resumes to every single job on Indeed and Monster and all the job search engines. And eventually someone will hire you. And then you go into your boss and say, by the way, here's my resignation. And so that's called revenge hiring. So it's taking it out on your boss. That's the that's the newest trend. Really? But as I say, there's there's so many things happening right now. It's it's hard to keep up with them. Well, on that topic alone, I've I've heard this line. I want to know whether you think it's true or not. That says, people quit bosses; they don't quit companies. Is that true? Absolutely. Yeah. And if you if you think about it, your boss is the, the, the major connection between you and the company. And so as much as a company may have a beautiful mission statement and give you lots of benefits, it's that one on one relationship that really links you to the company. And so certainly when I've resigned from companies, it certainly it's it was it was a certain individual rather than the company because I like the company. But, yeah, the boss isn't good. Um, and, and the boss is really that that emotional link between the company and the employee. Tell me about quiet quitting. What's that? So quiet quitting, uh, they've said this is a new term, but quiet quitting is really simply saying that I'm I'm only marginally engaged in work. You know, I'm going to come into work at nine. I'm going to leave at five, but I'm not going to do anything else. And so that's really the, the limit. So you've got a, a partially engaged employee and that's that's really all they are. And so you're paying a salary to somebody and they're really not fully charged. Whereas if you had somebody who is really engaged, you know, your top employee will produce 50% more than your marginally or quietly quitting employee. And what's the great resignation? Well, the great resignation is, is quite interesting. So we haven't seen as much in Canada as we have in the U.S., but certainly in the U.S. following COVID, a lot of people decided to re-engineer their careers, re-engineer their lives. And so people were making choices and saying, I'm not going to work for the same company. I'm not going to tolerate that boss. And so they were resigning in mass. And we have seen that to a lesser extent in Canada. But certainly if you look at industries like healthcare, you look at the education system, you look at the restaurant industry, we've seen certainly a, a, a migration away from those. So people are certainly seizing this opportunity to say, okay, I'm not going to tolerate that anymore. I'm going to look for something different. And, and that's where there's there's all the opportunities, both for companies and, and for individuals. And just a week or two ago, I heard for the first time this term, the great breakup. Uh, have you heard this term? And is it just like the great resignation, but just for females? Well, I, I well, it doesn't matter. You can break up with anyone these days. Uh, absolutely, Brian. So, so it, it's it's probably a hybrid of the uh, uh, of the, uh, the the great resignation. But certainly, yeah, people are more willing uh, to walk away from a job. I mean, when when you and I were 
were young and we had old parents, you know, they would work for a company for 30 or 40 years. I mean, in today's environment, if I'm looking at a resume and I see someone that's had a job for five years and he's had three of them, that's pretty good because we've we've lost that commitment to companies. And so it's much easier, uh, as I say, breaking up is hard to do, uh, not so much in 2023. Now, I understand that you... Um have done some pioneering pioneer pioneering work in compassion. Tell me what yes. that's all about. Well, several years ago when in my corporate life, I was the uh, the director of HR for GlaxoSmithKline Pharmaceuticals and looking after policies and that. And I had an employee in Edmonton phone me up one day and she said, Frank, I have to talk to you. My husband has been diagnosed with terminal cancer. He has three months to live. I want to spend my remaining time with him, but I do need support as I do that. And so at the time, I thought, well, what can I do? And so I fudged the system and I put her on, quote, sick leave. And so she got paid for those three months. Uh, her husband did pass away and she came back to work. And she said, Frank, I'm, I'm eternally grateful to uh, you and GSK for giving me that time. And so based on that, I, I worked with the president of GSK, uh, Paul Lucas, and we drafted the first compassionate leave policy in Canada. And that allowed people to take time off work with pay to look after a spouse or a partner or someone who might be dying. So five years later, GSK is making the H1N1 vaccine. And so the federal minister of health is working with GSK and happened to be meeting with Paul Lucas. And she said, Paul, you know, we're always interested in new policies. Are you doing anything different? And Paul picked up my policy and said, here it is. Try this. And so that policy through that strange mixture of circumstances uh, became the foundation for the Compassionate Leave Policy and Employment Insurance Canada today. And so that policy has probably benefited about 30,000 Canadians as they look for Look, care for their loved ones in their final days. That's got to be incredibly rewarding, Frank. Congratulations, and thank you very much for that. Well, thank you. And and I think it really gets to the heart of you know what makes great organizations or even a great country, and that's around compassion. Um, we've, you know, years ago in business, you would never see compassion was never recognized as a, as a skill or a quality, whereas I think now uh, the greatest leaders that we look up to have compassion. You know, they, they talk about the president of the U.S. being the consoler in chief. So I think that whole area of, of compassion is something we need to do. And, and certainly we need to engage in when business on a regular basis. I did interview Paul Lucas at one point in time in the past, and uh, he really was uh, an inspirational leader, wasn't he? Absolutely. Yeah, he was. Um, he and I did some some cool stuff together when I worked there, uh, but certainly he was an innovator. And again, um, you know, it was all about doing what's right for society. It's helping other people. And so that was uh, that was very much a hallmark of many of much of the work we did there. And that got me engaged with uh, great places to work. And GSK at the time was one of Canada's great places to work. And then since then, I've actually used that for my practice in terms of helping companies uh, become certified as great places to work. Well, you've got quite the list to hear. Uh, manufacturing, agribusiness, IT services, trucking, accounting, brewing, water sports, professional associations, medical and veterinarian clinics, as well as musicians and even a magician. Yes. The only thing about the magician is he made my money disappear. <laughs> You're the consultant. You're supposed to make money for yourself, not to, for him to <laughs> Yes. Yeah, we were helping him with a performance contract. So something, but again, virtually any any business needs some sort of HR support, you know, whether it's a contract, whether it's a relationship. And, and as, as the world has become more complex, managing those relationships is, is more important than ever. And also more fraught with peril. You know, we have more, more legal claims than we've had before. No and, and to some extent... You know, we're trying to make the world a better place. So, you know, th those things are, are naturally going to come up. Well, we're going to take a break for some messages and come back in just two minutes with Frank Newman, an HR expert, and talk a little bit more about what's happening in the workplace. Um, you know, uh, employment levels, uh, uh, labor force participation, some of his uh, uh, suggestions on uh, what's happening, uh, how leadership has to change, how companies have to change, how bosses have to change. This is going to be an interesting conversation today. Stick with us. We'll be back in two minutes.
Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumbie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Our topic tonight is um, is human relations. It's it's the workplace. It's jobs. It's employment. Uh, it's the great resignation. It's the it's the it's the great uh, breakup. It's quiet quitting. It's uh, what was the other one you said? Oh, uh, revenge hiring. Revenge, revenge. revenge hiring. That's right. Yes, revenge hiring sounds uh, sounds like it's an interesting uh, an interesting place out there in the workplace uh, today. Uh, our guest is Frank Newman, who has got thirty years of experience in corporate HR with some of Canada's leading companies like Texaco, GlaxoSmithKline, and Manulife. And then eight years ago, he started his own company, and he's been consulting with lots of different companies in uh, primarily southwestern Ontario uh, in the manufacturing, aggregate business, uh, IT services, trucking, counting, brewing, water sports, professional associations, medical and veterinary clinics, as well as musicians, and as he mentioned, even a magician. And I want to come back to that because that sounds like it's a good story. Um, Frank, you know, with this quiet quitting, with this great resignation, with this great breakup and stuff like this, is this just because unemployment is so low? And so therefore there's lots of options out there. If if unemployment was a little bit higher and it was harder to get a job, would you not have any of this? Or is this because COVID did something and we all took a time out and we all came to some sort of a realization about what's important in life? What is it? Is it is it because we've actually thought about things differently or is it just because it's easier to get another job? What do you think, Frank? What is it? Well, it, 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 it's just about everything you've suggested. If you think about it, we've seen more change in the world of work in the last two and a half years uh, than they saw in the Industrial Revolution. So if you imagine, you know, two and a half years ago, I would not be doing this over Zoom. Nope. We would be we would be meeting face to face. I'd be sitting in the radio studio. So So we've allowed technology to change much of the work we do in terms of simply having having, you know, electronic meetings. We've also in that time, we've discovered, hey, we can work from home. You know, we can, we, you know, the amazing thing is people can be productive at home. Who would have thought of that two and a half years ago? And at the same time, while all that was going on in the world of work, uh, we had lots of social awareness increasing. So in terms of, uh, you know, uh, black rights, we've had gay rights, uh, we've had a recognition of indigenous rights. So many of the ills and the I guess saying the mistreatment in society has been slowly being remedied uh, over that time. So we've had all that kind of change. And at the same time, we've also had the, the scare of our lives that maybe we won't live to see another day. Yeah. And so all this has encouraged people to uh, rethink their lives. And at the same time as that's been happening, we've actually had a labor shortage because we've had people leaving the workplace. Uh, in Canada, we've had lower immigration for the last uh, two and a half years than we've had. And we've also got fewer younger people entering the workplace. So if you think about it, it's really like a perfect storm. And so as a result, uh, we've now shifted to what used to be an employer's market to being an employee's market. So now, you know, I, as a consumer, as, a, as, a, as an employee, I have far more power than I've ever had. And probably, you know, in the 40 odd years I've been working, I've never imagined anything like this. So companies, have they changed and adapted or is it just employees that have changed and adapted? Well, companies had to adapt because clearly, you know, with COVID, we had to we had to change instantly. So obviously business has become much more technically astute and also businesses have had to become more agile. They've had to be able to switch product lines. They've had to switch suppliers. And so businesses ha have had to become much more agile and much more flexible. Um, they're also much more aware of risk. And certainly there's been a shift in terms of the electronic medium. But the other thing that businesses have realized is they need to create what I call the elastic workforce. And this is where you have a core group of employees, but then you can also flex that to meet the requirements of business. So you'll have some temporary contract staff. You might use some manpower staff. And so uh, businesses have had to change and adapt. Yeah. At the same time, you know, we've also had people need to change too, right? No question. So have people changed? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, first of all, their, their expectations of business have changed. You know, so now if I produce a job ad, you know, the first question people ask me is, is this a work from home or can I? 
can't do it to go into the office. Yeah. And so suddenly we have this variant in the workforce called the hybrid workforce. People, the other thing that people, people have realized. Let's, let's talk about that for a second. Though. People, people seem to really like that. Um, I've been doing some recruiting of late and, uh, and people up front, as you say, are asking if they can uh, work from home, you know, not all the time, but, you know, one, two, three days a week. Um, mm-hmm. and yet a lot of CEOs want people to come back to the office and they say that it's because collaboration doesn't happen. Is it is that because collaboration doesn't happen or because they don't know if people are actually really working when they're at home? <laughs> well, originally when COVID started, nobody nobody believed that anyone was productive at work. And so there was this great cloud of facts that if I'm working at home, I'm not going to be productive. Well, we now know statistically that you can be 95% as effective at home or more uh, by working at home as compared to being in the office. But part of the challenge is then when you have people working remotely, how do you connect them with their coworkers? How do you get what I call bursts of collaboration? And so many of my clients, and I got clients 50-50, some are all at home, some are all in the office, and there's probably no perfect medium. But what is important is the fact that you do need to have those, you need to still build those connections. And so one of my clients uh, has people working, uh, has had people working from home for 30 years. And so we got together in a physical meeting two weeks ago, and they said they really miss gathering and getting together as a small team to do something social. So there is that herd instinct in us that says we want to be together. But at the same time, um, People value the fact that I don't have to commute to downtown Toronto anymore. So yeah, there's, well, I think they do. And and so you're 95% productive. Where did that uh, statistic come from? Um, there was a variety of different sources. Uh, a lot of it's anecdotal, but certainly yep. I've seen from the work I've done with my clients. Um, you know, people have found ways to make work more more productive. You know, we're, yes. we're using different. Yeah. I, I find that I'm actually more productive um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, it seems like I add the commute time that would have been lost time uh, to uh, to the amount of time I work. Uh, so I'm actually working more hours uh, than I would have worked if I had to do the commute. Um, in addition, I find that um, that the nine to five or eight to six or whatever it was that I used to work um, uh, no longer exists. If someone calls me, you know, whenever I'm uh, traveling when I'm on holidays, uh, late in the evening, early in the morning on a Sunday, I end up uh, taking that call because sort of there's less work and home separation because work and home are, are the same. Um, the computer is always on that desk. It's always open. The emails always come in and they they make a little sound when they come in. So it's as, as if work has taken over more of, uh, of your life. And then I think finally, um, I do miss the social aspect. There's no question. But I also find that I'm Wasting less time chatting in the lunchroom at the coffee sh- at the coffee uh, uh, station or or whatnot. So I would think I'm actually more productive. Yeah, well, and, and you you sound like a, a very productive guy, to be honest, Brian. Um, and, and I think many people appreciate you know exactly the point you raised. You know, I'm not commuting. I'm not having to park my car. I don't have to pay for gas. You know, I don't have to pay for parking. Heaven forbid. Yeah. Um, but but on the other hand, I've talked to people who, uh, and it's interesting because millennials actually would rather have the more social aspect than work from home, uh, which was a surprise to me. Uh, so certainly that sense of collaboration and teamwork, um, you know, it's important to find a way to inject that if you are working from home. I do think uh, that collaboration. Because otherwise you, you can't get a... You know, those, yeah. I think that collaboration and teamwork are important. There's no question. And, but you can get that through a couple of days in the office. You don't have to be in the office every day. And I have, I know so many millennials, my own, some of my own kids included, that are working um, remotely from Whistler or from the beach or from somewhere. Mm-hmm. They're, 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 and they're, and they're still working full hours and they're being very productive, but they're taking it as an opportunity to become, I heard this word uh, just a couple of months ago, digital nomads, where they, uh, they can travel around and uh, digitally connect in with people. 
Mm -hmm. Well, well, the other aspect of that, Brian, is is what we call the gig, gig economy. So now you've got professionals, perhaps like like your kids and, and like my kids, who have a trade or have a consulting practice or some education, and they can go and create their own business. You know, for two grand, you can create a website. You can work anywhere, and you be, basically become like a uh, like a Ronan, the uh, uh, the Japanese warrior who went around from uh, warlord to warlord offering their services. And, and so we're seeing more young people are taking that entrepreneurial route because for companies, as they create their elastic workforce, they can engage these people, have them come and go and so on. So it's actually opened up a whole new world of, of work and opportunity for people. The only challenge is a lot of people working the gig economy uh, don't get the benefits of you know insurance plan and health and dental care and so on. Uh, so there is a bit of a risk to that. But it comes down to that principle that you want to be employable, not employed in today's world. Can you create culture digitally? Can you interact with people where, you know, body language and facial facial expressions and stuff like that are so critically important to create a long term relationship uh, with people uh, from a business standpoint? Can you do that over Zoom or over Teams or over WebEx? Absolutely. You know, and, and a lot of creative companies are using, um, you know, we, you know, I, I've seen some of my clients, you know, during COVID, we had uh, uh, Quantini meetings and we would have, you know, meetings on Zoom with, with 40 people and we would all have a, a beer or a drink. Um, we even, uh, one of my clients uh, had one of their long-term employees pass away in the middle of COVID. And we actually had a, a COVID memorial service over over Zoom. And to be honest, Brian, it was one of the most uh, emotional experience I've ever seen. And as I say, if you can connect with, with people, you know, through content, you know, through Zoom, you, you can achieve as much as you can in person, but you probably lose some of the spontaneity. And that's, that's probably the difference. Whereas if you and I were sitting bumping in each other, uh, into each other over a coffee, we might talk about something a little bit different. Well, I think you do lose some of that spontaneity and some of the personal um, you know, rapper tree going back and forth where you ask, you know, it's difficult uh, when you're in a, in a meeting with 40 people on zoom to ask, you know, how are the kids and, you know, did you go skiing last week or, you know, whatever that sort of casual conversation you would typically have as you're walking into the boardroom or, or leaving the boardroom. So I think you, we've lost some of that personal touch, but I, you know, on the other hand, I think we are productive. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's weird uh, with, uh, you know, the sharing uh, that you can do with the PowerPoint presentations or Excel worksheets or, or accounting statements and things like that, or even contracts. I have found that I've had meetings where I've been in the office in an office and, and someone else has been in an office just in the hallway. And we still do it via Teams or Zoom because we're going to share an Excel file. And to do it without that Excel file in front of both of us is uh, less productive. And so it's like this virtual digital world has really changed our lives, our work lives. Yeah. And, and we've become much more comfortable with it. I mean, the, the first few times we we're all on Zoom, we were all worried about, you know, is our hair right and and so on. And now it's it's become another extension of our personalities. And so so some of my clients have even said, well, we better train our people in terms of how to present on Zoom because it's a little bit different. So clearly we want them to have the right clothing on, uh, ideally the right background. But you know, recognizing that in a sense, uh, we all we all share your role, Brian. We're all now broadcasters of our own of I, our I, own individual image. I notice you're wearing a jacket and I'm not, so I guess I didn't I, I didn't get the memo. I apologize in that regard. Sorry so, about that, Brian. Let me let me ask you, Frank. Companies that um, are willing to be hybrid versus companies that demand everyone uh, to come to the office. Who's going to be more successful in the future? Do you think? Well, uh, to be honest, Brian, I, I think the jury is out on that. I think. The smartest companies will know how to leverage people's energy and and connect with their emotions. So whether they are in the office and they have a, a quarterly barbecue or whether they're doing Zoom meetings and, and having jugglers and clowns and whatever, um, I I think that the secret is using either the technology, but but it's around leadership and the leaders have to find a way to make sure they're creating a rich culture for people where they want to come into work every day, where they feel excited about working for Brian or Frank. Um, and and companies are smart enough. We'll use either technology. So so I, to be honest, I think, you know, the it's, it's an agnostic answer. There's no perfect answer. But I can guarantee you over the next 30 years, there's going to be all kinds of books written around. Is it hybrid or in the office and which is better? 
I personally think that the hybrid's going to win out. I really do. I think that uh, people have uh, have realized that a little bit more flexibility is critical in life, and that uh, coming to the office to collaborate and to connect and to communicate um, uh, is critically important some of the time. But you don't need to do that all of the time. And I find that you know sometimes, frankly, some of my most productive work is when I close the door and just you know put my head down and, and do the work. And I need to do that, even though the vast majority of my day is spent talking to other people, I need the quiet time. And that's a lot easier to do at home than in, yeah. I'm in the office. And, and, and so therefore, you know, I remember in my old, in my old life before COVID, I would do it late at night when everyone was gone, or I'd have to do it at home on the weekends. And now, you know, when I'm home hybrid, I can do that and do it productively. Yeah. Well, well, part of it is too, you know, a lot of organizations have instant, instant chat, right? And so, so as much as they're working on their, their, their Excel spreadsheet, they're getting all these messages bombarding them. And so some of my clients have had to have what they call a quiet zone. So between 10 and 11 or whatever that time is, uh, thou shalt not interrupt Brian and allow him to focus because many people have their emails popping up all the time, or they got chat messages popping up. So even as we work on those you know, unique projects by ourselves, uh, it's always wise to be able to have a way to turn off some of that technology because it, it's very easy to get focused. And as you say, sometimes our best work is done just simply thinking. I also have gotten a couple of emails from people, uh, you know, uh, uh, automatic responses. I don't answer my uh, emails until 11 to 12 every day. And so therefore, if I don't answer right away, it's because I'm waiting to my 11, 12 time period. So people are scheduling times where they read and respond to emails rather than doing it on a on a regular uh, minute by minute basis, which uh, I think is far more productive. It, it, it can uh, bother a boss that wants to hear back from you right away, but it actually ends up uh, being, I think, more productive. Well, and and what's interesting, Brian, is is you know the the Ontario government introduced this disconnect from work mandatory policy. So now it's mandatory for companies in Ontario with over twenty five people to have a policy that says thou shalt not have to reply to emails after normal working hours unless it's an emergency. And so that policy, which hasn't really changed too much, but was basically driven by the fact that during COVID, people, as you said earlier, were working all kinds of hours. Oh, yeah. They were, you know, the, the computer was on and, and people were quite frankly exhausted. And so the government said, uh, thou shalt have a policy to do this. And so you are seeing more uh, companies with emails saying, uh, I'm not going to respond between X, X time and Y and so on. So I think that's important because to some extent, we got mentally fried during COVID if you were, you know, if you were working from home. Uh, many people suffered from that. And so uh, we now have uh, official escape mechanisms to do that, but it really hasn't changed too much. But I think people have gotten smarter about not overworking through through Zoom and through being at home. The great breakup, the great resignation, uh, quiet quitting, and the new term I've just learned tonight about uh, revenge hiring. Sounds like it's an interesting world we're living in. We're going to take a break uh, for some messages and be back in just two minutes with Frank Newman. And he's going to walk us through a couple of, uh, of slides that he's got in a presentation in regards to uh, how work has changed. And he's really going to give us a good orientation to uh, you know what we need to think about when we're taking a job, when we're employing people, when we're designing our organizations, et cetera. Stay with us, everyone. We'll be back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crabby Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Frank Newman. He is the founder and CEO of a, of a company that consults in uh, in HR, human resource management, uh, he's got uh, a couple decades of experience in uh, human resources with GlaxoSmithKline, with some beer companies, uh, with Manulife, uh, et cetera. And he's been doing some consulting for the last seven years or so. And, and he's recently made a major speech on the world of work in 2023. And he's going to walk us through a couple of the points that he made in that speech. Frank, tell us what uh, what you think about the world of work in 2023. Thank you, Brian. So, so basically, as I was saying earlier, you know, it really has been an unprecedented change. And, and so basically, I've said, you know, we've heard it, it's a tsunami of change, and it really is. It's unprecedented uh, in, in this century. And so 
what we're seeing is uh, this is a result of what I call, to some extent, a fragile society. So uh, society has been buffeted between COVID and between changes to health and work. And so we're living in a very uh, fragile environment, uh, which makes change difficult. It also makes uh, improvement uh, challenging. And we've seen challenging times in terms of increasing Zoom meetings in terms of technology. Uh, we dealt with COVID. Uh, we dealt with Black Lives Matter. We dealt with indigenous rights. And, and we've also uh, had to adapt to wearing masks uh, all over the place. And in fact, it feels weird, quite frankly, now not to be going into a store not wearing a mask. And certainly the ways of working have dramatically changed. And so we're seeing uh, lots of changes in terms of business, in terms of needing to be agile, uh, having a flexible workforce. We've also experienced working from home, which uh, until the last two and a half years, people thought was absolutely, how are you going to get any work done uh, by working from home? I do and think so, that, uh, you know, on, on this point that uh, we've all been impacted, but but females particularly have been impacted. A lot of uh, females have, uh, as you show, uh, you know, are dealing with childcare at the same time as they're dealing with, uh, with work. Um, and there's lots of uh, suggestions that they've taken on more of the the house duties and and I worry at times that we've sort of gone backwards in uh, in, uh, in 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 women's rights in regards to uh, uh, equity in the workplace uh, um, and I think that's a negative. That said, some of them love it and uh, and that's sort of this great breakup that uh, they're, uh, they're they're enjoying spending more time with their children and spending more time at, at home. Yeah, well, and, and certainly, you know, during COVID, when the daycare centers were closed, I mean, the, the bulk of looking after kids suddenly fell, uh, fell back to, you know, many, many mothers, yeah. and uh, probably more so than fathers. And I think we're, we're getting out of that. And two I other think points. Two... go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say two other points on the on, on uh, your last point about, uh, you know, change that we've been buffeted by. The uh, supply chain disruption has been unprecedented. And that's really changed a lot of different businesses. And a war, you know, geopolitical issues, um, and whether it's uh, you know a war in Ukraine or uh, or or uh, you know issues uh, in regards to China that have come up just in the last little while, we've had geopolitical issues like we haven't seen since probably 1989. Yeah. Well, and this kind of comes back to our fragile society, because not only have, as you say, have we had COVID, but we now got a war in Ukraine, we've got supply issues, you know, it takes three years to get a, apparently three years to get a Porsche, which uh, it doesn't concern me too much, but that's one of those supply chain issues. And, and so, you know, even some of my clients who are in the customer service industry have seen this barrage of negative feedback. If something goes wrong, people feel it's okay to berate them and yell at them. Um, we've had to do uh, training courses for insurance companies uh, on how to deal with customers who will be so upset they will yell and scream and so on. So yeah, I think that's uh, true is that people feel more comfortable being mean uh, when they don't have to be face to face with someone because uh, they can do it on the yeah. telephone or on Zoom. Yeah, so so we've lost some of that civility, which I think is is, I is, a, is a is a tragedy. But again, because people are so emotionally taught, they're not responding the way they might have done with a little bit of patience and time. Yeah. So so in terms of you know changes the world of work, we're certainly seeing what I call the age of the entrepreneur. So for a few thousand dollars, you can create your own website, uh, you can create your own marketing plan, you can ship products in, you can do other things. And so uh, there's been a lot of liberation in the workplace, uh, allowing people to make their own, set their own courses. And it's interesting for a lot of the younger folks who are perhaps more disengaged with work than others. Uh, they're saying, yeah, I don't want to work for that big company and see my my parents who got screwed or mishandled by their by the boss. I want to be my own boss. And so we're seeing more and more uh, students going into business colleges, uh, studying entrepreneurship. And so that that's pretty exciting because certainly in in the uh, in, in the region we live in in Ontario, there, there's a ton of innovation. And so to some extent, these pressures have created uh, a need for companies to be more innovative. And uh, I was talking to Jim Carroll, the futurist, a while back, and he said, uh, we were asking the question, what's the jobs of the future? He said, the jobs of the future haven't been invented yet because we just don't know what's going to be there. So we've got this explosion of, of opportunity for individuals uh, and companies to forge their own destiny. And, and you know, the technology is there to do it. And now we've added the, the AI technology of the chat GPT. Uh, 
Uh, you know, we're going to put writers out of business, which is a bit of a tragedy, but certainly we're seeing more challenges on that one. I, I think that's very true. But it's interesting, as you're talking about this uh, gig economy and about entrepreneurship and things like this, the picture that uh, you show of the entrepreneur is this person's at a shared workplace. And so therefore, yes. even though they want to be entrepreneurial and run their own business, they still need that interaction with other people. They want to go to a shared workplace. They want to go and interact with and and, and meet other people and get assistance and collaborate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it was interesting. I was talking to a, a business developer, the, or an office, a building developer the other day. And uh, what we talked about was as he built apartment buildings, now what he's going to try and build in there is a shared workspace in the basement. So you'll have yeah. your gym, you'll have your swimming pool, and you'll have your shared workspace. So all these people can go down from their apartments in the morning and go to their shared workspace and then go back up to their uh, their apartments at night. So, um, and the other piece we're seeing uh, when we're talking real estate is uh, if you're you're selling a home now uh, people are going to want to know where does a home office go yeah yeah you know, we never thought about that 10 years ago yeah. or even two years ago now if you have a, a nice setup for home office that's a good thing no question so so one of the things that uh, has changed for people, and we talked about the great resignation or the great breakup, is people are, are really assessing through COVID their personal goals. And so people are saying, where do I want to live? You know, do I want to live in downtown Toronto or could I live in Collingwood or can I live in Barrie and so on? And so they're making decisions around the opportunity to be able to work further away. Uh, I have one gentleman I know who company is in Oakville. He's in Chatsworth, north of uh, north of Durham. And so people now have this freedom, which has been unprecedented. And, and so we're seeing lots of that. We're seeing a, a physical migration as well. But certainly as part of this, you know, people were really looking at that work life balance. Yeah, and as we talked earlier, yeah, the, the the hybrid workplace has allowed people to have better work life balance. Uh, both my son and daughter-in-law worked from home and my son said it was the greatest thing because he could drop it he could walk his kids to the bus stop and, and at the end of the day he can go and pick them up just just really really wonderful i interact i interviewed the president of a big planning company from his boat in the thousand islands <laughs> yeah yeah well, why not right i mean boats boats are good <laughs> uh, but the other thing and we forget about this is you know two years ago Companies were struggling with mandatory vaccine policies. Yeah. And I know for some of my clients, they they made decisions to terminate employees because they wouldn't be vaccinated. Now we look at that and say, you know, that's crazy. But then that was important because we needed to keep people safe. And so we sometimes we forget how how difficult the road has been to really get here. Yeah, I, I do think that uh, we overreacted in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I had clients who were uh, mandatory vaxxers and some who believed in freedom of choice. And so, uh, and again, it comes down to your corporate corporate culture, what's what's important to you, uh, and, and how do you manage that? Because on one hand, companies had the obligation to keep people safe in the workplace. It's a legislative requirement. On the other hand, said, well, maybe freedom of choice is fine and we'll take the risks. So again, it was a real testing time for organizations. What I argued for was either a vac proof of vaccine or proof that you were uh, COVID free. So uh, a negative test. Um, and, yeah. uh, and that seemed to work for a while. But then, you know, people started getting this, uh, what was it called, the, the neurovirus or whatever. And, uh, and, and right. you know, there were a lot of different things that would give you the symptoms and that other people didn't want to catch whether it was uh, COVID or not. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, you know, it was the first time in history, actually, Brian, at least on your history, we can ask people for, for medical information. I mean, yeah. in, in normal, normal times, you can't do that. So uh, as we looked at this, it's, all this has led to changes in terms of employee expectations. So one of the key things about what's changed is the fact that work uh, should ideally be done anywhere. So, so I've actually written work from anywhere policies. Uh, and certainly people are looking for that flexibility to either work from home or hybrid or whether it's four day week, et cetera. Um, and in fact, one of, one of my clients, uh, Paradigm Energy, uh, pioneered the four day work week 
not too long ago. And it was interesting as they put this in, because a lot of people were hesitant about it. They said, well, how am I going to get my work done? And uh, uh, they adjusted the hours of work slightly. But now after six months, uh, they would not go back to working five days a week. And and they have managed to overcome that urge to work on Friday. Uh, so I think we're going to see more of that. And as we think about the great employee employers of you know 2025, we're going to see more and more of those on on the four day work week. I love that. I have a six day work week. <laughs> Very good. You're you're doing well, Brian. But we'll have a conversation about that later. Okay. So so the other the other thing that's changed is is I call it I say time is the new currency. So. To the extent as an employer, you can give your employees more time, more time off, uh, more freedom of time. That is a powerful currency, and that's having more and more value. Because as long as you're paying people a respectable salary, uh, that's fine. That's going to get them in the door. But to allow people more time to uh, engage in, whether it's their families, whether it's less travel, that is a powerful uh, powerful currency. So, uh, so I encourage you know employers to think about how they do that. Uh, some of my employers have have even gone to the extent where they're giving people a day off to work for a charity, and that is that is incredibly powerful because that helps both the company, the charity, and the employee uh, to feel I good guess, about. I think that's environment. a brilliant idea. Yeah. Yeah. So so uh, so we call it volunteer day. And and so what we have people do is they go off and they can volunteer at a child's school or they volunteer at the Humane Society, or whatever. They take pictures. They then post it. They share it with other people. And uh, and we just have a wonderful dialogue because suddenly I realize that, oh, Brian is interested in animals or or, you know, Joan's interested in Ukrainian opera, whatever that is. So so it's a way to give back to to society, but also to acknowledge that and I, as an individual, contribute my own way to society with the sponsorship of my company. Excellent idea. The other thing we're seeing in terms of the world of benefits is, is clearly people are looking for benefit programs that support them. Uh, but as we have a slightly aging population, we're seeing more, more interest in RSP uh, plans among among employees. So, so certainly that is a growing trend. Um, the other trend we're seeing is in what's called employee assistance plan, where employees can get help, uh, whether it's legal help or psychological counseling help uh, through their employer. And this has been really uh, a growth area because uh, people are looking for more, you know, with all the stress of the last two and a half years, people are looking for a, a lot of support. And, and sometimes, you know, they, they, they can't access those services themselves. So the the smart employers and and probably about mm, probably about sixty three percent of employers have this now, but it's certainly a growth area. You know, I got a stand up desk um, just a little while ago. I use it probably half an hour, an hour a day. It's fantastic. One little stupid change, a stand up desk, and uh, and and it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I said, we're becoming more more conscious of that. I mean, more programs. Um, one of my one of my clients uh, toyed with the idea of actually giving all their employees a Peloton bike, and uh, now uh, that because, would be expensive. That well, it wasn't as expensive as you think. Peloton is very smart; they have programs, but but certainly. You know, employers are thinking out the box, right? Because you know, it's not it's not the typical Christmas turkey anymore. But yeah. but how can we how can we do things that help enrich their lives? And I think the best employers in in Canada will be thinking about those things because I it's, want to work for I want to work for the company because of the Peloton. Tell me who it is, <laughs> please now. Uh, I'll keep that a trade secret for the time being, Brian. But uh, uh, but but yeah, absolutely. I mean. And again, you know, for 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 two grand, uh, it has a huge impact. No question. The other thing that 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 I, I'm becoming more aware of, and that people are becoming more sensitive, to is the physical work environment. Uh, people, because of COVID, have been more aware of their surroundings than ever before. And so, if you have one of these offices that's I won't say old and decrepit, but doesn't look modern, doesn't look attractive, uh, that's going to be a harder draw to certainly if you're trying to get people back into the office, but certainly. You know, people are being more conscious of their environment. And so to the extent that you can, you know, spruce up your work environment, you know, get rid of those horrible chairs, uh, that's going to have an impact on folks. And they're going to appreciate that because, again, uh, it's kind of what the company does. And the physical landscape will determine how emotionally engaged you are with the company. You know, Frank, I had a job uh, where my office it was a huge office, but it was in the basement. Um, it was actually in the basement of an arena. Um, so it was a cool job, but big office but no windows. 
I will never, ever, ever take a job again without a window. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, th those are important. Well, and and the smart office is designed now. They put the offices uh, for the, for the executives on the inside, and then the outside walls are all glass, and that's where that's where the staff sits. Uh, so, so I think being conscious of that because uh, you know people are very kind, as I say, the the total environment. So even when you walk in the receptor, the the door of a company, and you see the reception area, that sends a message. And so thinking about your company branding but also your comfort for employees yeah. is is absolutely imperative and a little paint goes a long way so the other thing we're dealing with in many cases is people are quite frankly disengaged and so there's been studies done by the uh, uh by the global uh, gallup group uh did a study that said 21 percent of employees are, are engaged at work which means that there's another uh you know 80 80 89 or 79 yeah, groups 79 percent that are unengaged disengaged exactly and and so so as as an employer uh we need to be conscious of that because that's that's lost productivity uh beyond belief and the other stu study they've identified is that youth disillusionment um is number eight on the risk of immediate risks from the economic world forum and so uh, certainly for the younger generation you know COVID has been extremely difficult and as they look at their opportunities in the workforce um, there's a lot of disillusionment there and so the smart companies will be uh, trying to be sensitive to that understand you know how do we how do we attract people into professions like bricklaying or or you know, manual labor and stuff, or, you know, where we need these people. So uh, that's certainly a, a challenge we have as a society to try and make that better. Okay. And deteriorating mental health and quiet quitting. Yeah. So, so as I said earlier, quiet quitting isn't necessarily a new activity, but certainly, you know, we've got more people who are just coming in and leaving. And so the challenge for an employer is how do you, how do you keep those folks engaged? Yeah. And, you know, some of the warning signs is you're going to see there's decreased performance. You're going to have people who are leaving right on time. Uh, they're not volunteering for work anymore. Uh, you also may find there's increased sick days and as well as people just auto automatically shutting off at the end of the day you know you send you want to phone them at five after five they're, they're just they're not, not. They're, they're out the door no question they're gone uh, so so what i encourage my my clients to do in those cases is, is first of all uh, you know we go back to elmer the safety elephant who talked about stop look and listen and so we want to make sure that employers are really listening and connecting with their employees that's going to be so important as as we move ahead and also really taking some time to think how robust is your work culture? And, you know, work culture is not just the mission statement on the wall, but it's it's the heart, it's the beliefs and, and the practices that you have. And more and more employees are making decisions based on culture. You know, yeah, we see that. Really true. It's, it's, and it's not the mission statement. So it's it's not what you say, it's what you do. It's, a, it's actually how you act on a day in day out basis. I think that's really key and whether it is uh you know uh esg environmental attitudes or social attitudes or just the culture about how you treat people i think it's really uh, really critical we're going to take a break for some messages and come back with some concluding comments with frank newman in just two minutes stay with us everyone this is just a fascinating conversation Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're having a really interesting conversation with Frank Newman uh, tonight. He's an HR human re uh, relations expert. He's uh, been in the business a couple of decades. He worked for GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, he's been a consultant, and he's uh, really described to us, you know, how the workplace has changed. Frank, let's make it personal for a second. Given all this, what what should an individual do? Well, the, these are great times for individuals, but the, the style of change is important. So the first thing you want to do as, a, as an individual is, first of all, make sure you're employable, not employed. So continue to drive, develop your skills, learn new skills, uh, because you may need them anywhere because you can't guarantee the company will be there. Second thing you can do is keep networking. So make sure you keep contacts with people, whether it's through LinkedIn or through your personal connections, because ultimately people do business with their friends. Keep learning. So make sure you continue to learn stuff on whether it's on the Internet, whether it's chat, GPT, whatever that is. Fourth 
take risks, you know, do different things, learn different things, volunteer, you know, get some volunteer experience, bring those back to the workplace. And then finally, ultimately, what employers are looking for these days is a positive attitude. And, you know, we can train people on engineering, we can train people on rocket science, but we can't train, train people on attitude. So make sure you have a positive attitude, accept risk, and attitude trumps everything. Excellent. Those are great suggestions. You also uh, gave me a couple of suggestions for what companies can do to build culture. You had uh, five of them. Can you quickly run through those five things that you think companies need to do to, to, to build culture? Yeah. Yeah. Basically, so so companies need to make sure they manage and to attract and retain talent because that's going to be key for them. Uh, they want to encourage collaboration and teamwork, whether you're working from home or working uh, remotely. You also want to encourage productivity and innovation. So innovation is the is the heart and the excitement of business. You also want to focus on improving customer satisfaction, and you're going to do that by having a great employee culture. And then finally, uh, if you have a strong culture, you're going to have better business goals and your strategy is going to be aligned. Uh, so those are all things that you can do uh, you know, and your people. You know, Frank, I think this... Uh... These, these five suggestions that you've had for both businesses uh, to create culture uh, and uh, suggestions for what individuals can do are really, really helpful because we spend so much of our lives, so much of our, 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 our life on this earth working. Why would we want to do it if we're not happy? Well, well, precisely. And so so ultimately, Brian, I, I've been doing it for 47 years. And so my goal, I have for all Canadians, if you can believe that, uh, I want to make sure that people can have enriched, uh, meaningful lives through their working experience. Because as you say, we spend a lot of time here. And so I have this, this dream, this vision uh, for all my clients that if they're successful, uh, when their employees wake up in the morning, they leap out of bed to run to work because they're so excited about their jobs. And I think you know we owe it to Canadians uh, as a as a nation to create those positive experiences uh, because it's going to really enrich everyone's life. Frank Newman, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. If people want to contact you, maybe to hire your services or just check out uh, some of your uh, your writings, how do they best do that? Uh, they can contact me through uh, Newman Human Resource Consulting Inc. Hugh, Newman Human Resource Consulting Inc. Uh, Frank Newman. That was really a fascinating conversation tonight. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Brian. Thank you. That's our show for tonight, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I remind you I'm on every Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online, uh, even from Breslau, Ontario, at www.saga960am.ca. All my podcasts and video casts are available on my website, briancrombie.com. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Frank. Good night.